Welcome into the Arcub Sports Business Podcast. Thank you so much for joining us. And today we're joined by a very special guest, a professor at the University of San Francisco uh, in the Sports Management Master's Program, Dr. Michael Goldman, who's done a lot of work in sponsorship, sports sponsorship, fan behavior, a, a lot of really fascinating stuff. He's also got a faculty role, adjunct faculty role, uh, with the Gordon Institute of Business Science in Johannesburg, as well as his his role at the University of San Francisco. And it was a fascinating conversation. We got into a lot of the nuances, especially of, of fan behavior and segmentation. So without further ado, I'll send you over there now, ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Michael Goldman. All right. We're joined here by Michael Goldman of the University of San Francisco. Um, thank you so much for coming on. Um, Thanks for the invitation. It's great. Yeah. Well, um, I, I've seen some of your work. You've done a lot of work on sponsorship value, uh, fan behavior. Um, and one thing I thought was kind of interesting is you did some work on fan disengagement. Uh, people basically only focus on one side of it, engagement. How do you get more engagement? How do you get more people? Um, what's some of the stuff you discovered in your search through disengagement? Absolutely. It's a critical question because... You know, we, we focus on how we get fans and customers to fall in love with our teams. But as we know, in life and in business, people sometimes fall out of love with the teams. And if we can work out what those triggers are, what those early warning signs are, well, maybe we as teams and leagues and conferences and tournaments can mitigate those downsides, right? Can we identify which segments of our season ticket holder base of our uh, you know group ticket packages, uh, whatever the, the ticketing and the customer level might be, can we identify which of those segments might be at higher risk of churning, right? And business is all about retention because we know from a loyalty point of view and from a business point of view, customer lifetime value, we know that the sunk cost, the customer acquisition cost is spread over the lifetime of the customer. And so if a fan stays with us for longer, buys more shirts, come to more games, buys more beers. Uh, overall, as a business, uh, we are generating more revenues and higher margin, right? Greater profitability from that group of customers. So working out who's going to churn is a critical component for any business. In the sports business, we haven't always focused on that. And part of the reason is that we're very focused on the front end. We're very focused on getting them from birth to death, and getting um, you know, customers, supporters to become fans as quickly as possible and as deeply as possible. And then we just hope they stay forever. But if we can understand what some of those triggers are, we can mitigate. What the research found, um, some of our students that we've worked with uh, in South Africa and in India and in the US, is that uh, some of the disengagement triggers are about uh, service delivery. Right. So some of the things we know about where the hot dogs are not big enough or hot enough, the beer is not cold enough um, and the general feel of going to an event uh, lets me down. So I work myself up. I have these expectations. I see some amazing stuff. I go and it just doesn't shoot the lights out. And so over a period of time, not overnight, but over a period of time, uh, reduced customer experience value starts to degrade in that brand equity. Essentially, it moves us to fall out of love, right? Because it gradually eats away at the reason I fell in love with the team the first time. Obviously, people are very focused on losing. And so if the team performance uh, goes through a bit of a slump, that can lead to some disengagement as well. And certainly the data supports that that is one of the issues, but not the primary issue. So it plays a role, as with most things, but it's not the primary issue. A second issue or a third issue um, is some of the logistical issues around the event, right? Not just when I'm there, but getting there and getting home. And I think one of the big customer service and service delivery issues that our industry has seen over the last few years is that uh, we need to think about the total customer experience from the moment they leave home to the moment they get back. 
not just when they arrive at our facility. And so working with our public transportation partners, working with, uh, you know, shared drive services, the Ubers, the Lyfts, et cetera, um, thinking about transportation processes in and out, uh, you know, ingress and, and exit and all of those kinds of issues, that's an important component of overall delivery, right? Our, our airline friends have known this for a while. Right, you go and have this wonderful vacation, um, and you associate that positively with the airline that took you there. But when your luggage takes ninety minutes to come on that turnstile afterwards, and it's got nothing to do with the airline, but we associate it with the airline. In the same way, if I'm driving away from an NFL game, and it's taking me ninety minutes to get out of the parking lot, um, you know that that some way reflects badly on the organization. So those are some of the disengagement variables. Again, it's over a period of time. It affects different customers in different ways, so different segments. Um, and it's a lot about the customer service environment, the ability for us to deliver on the promise. And as with all business, if we fail to deliver on the promise over and over and over again, it's going to decay. We're going to have to replace some of those customers we lose with new ones coming in the front end. Yeah. Well, and you touched on something there about winning and losing being a part of it, but not the whole thing. And I think that's like a, a huge focus is winning. Uh, but as we've seen, and there's been some work on this, you know, there's the whole Chicago Cubs lovable losers thing. Um, do you, is there a way to quantify how much it matters or does it matter uh, only to certain segments or kind of all of the above um, as far as like what value that team would bring yeah. to brands? Yeah, two key issues. The one is it does matter in different ways to different groups. Not all fans are the same, right? And whether you call them diehards or fair weather or you call them fans or spectators, we know that um, human beings consume our sports business product for different reasons. There'll be those who care about what happens on the field and there'll be those who don't care about what happens on the field. And they're there for hospitality purposes or socialization or group belonging. And so the motive that drives people to consume also influences the extent to which winning and losing is an issue. And so if I'm going to a baseball game and I don't really care who wins or loses, yeah, I'm going for the food, for the drink, for the time with my kids, for the time with my colleagues, my loved ones, whatever it is, uh, just for a good night out, then I'm going to be less affected, less negatively impacted if the team loses every so often. Whether, you know, the alternative is a buddy of mine who grew up playing baseball, who lives and dies by what happens on the field, uh, who can tell you all the information about the last 10 years of that team. Uh, and for them, they are really affected by what happens. So segments matter, right? As with all things, not everyone's the same. I think the second point that research shows um, is this question of the uncertainty principle. The uncertainty principle in academic terms, is the extent to which fans or spectators or customers believe that you could win, right? And what the research shows is you don't want to be on either side of the spectrum where you are always winning or you are always losing. Both of those are not great. And I know the sports fans listening in will be a little bit confused about the always winning thing. But as we've seen in Formula One, as we've seen in a few other sports, if you are always winning and you are dominant for maybe a decade or whatever it is, the overall engagement, the overall excitement and benefits of consumption reduce. Yeah, the, the greatness becomes boring. Right, exactly. Yeah. And, and so there's, there's no competitiveness anymore. So the uncertainty principle is um, that fans, customers have to believe that there's a chance you're going to win. Right. And they have to believe that there's something up for grabs. Right. That it's going to be competitive in some way. Um, and, and so that's the happy medium that teams are looking for, that you want to have some strong performances. You want to have some some key athletic achievements that you can celebrate, that you can you know attract to those who care about the sport. But you have to add a whole bunch of other things around that, a whole bunch of value and benefits around the winning and losing so that you capture people for more than just winning. Because um, you can't always win everything, right? No matter how much you spend. 
Uh, you can't always win everything. The bounce of the ball is not going to go against you at some point. Uh, and so you have to build a business that provides more value than just winning and losing. And I wonder if that, does that vary between leagues potentially? I know like college football, for instance, has expanded the playoff kind of exactly in what you're saying. Basically, there's three or four teams that are probably going to win. But if 12 get in or 16 get in or 50 have a chance to be one of the 16, yeah. it sort of drives that across the board. Is that is that something that you've seen that different leagues, the winning and losing sort of matters more or less or... Yeah, it plays out in different ways across different sports and leagues and countries. But the overall principle is the same, right? It just plays out in different ways. So if you think about uh, the NFL on one side and baseball on the other side, right? MLB and NFL, you've only got this short number of games and the season's really tight. Um, and so your path to the Super Bowl is fairly well defined. Right. Uh, and so a few losses and you're in big trouble. Right. Whereas if you think about an MLB season or even an NBA season, um, you know, you've got hundreds. And so you lose a few here, you lose a few there. It's OK. Right. And it all plays out. So, you know, in that sense, the win loss ratio plays out in a slightly different way. Uh, but the principle still applies. Yeah. Well, and I know you've talked about the segmentation. Are there like certain teams or leagues that have done that better to like lean into providing maybe different things to the different segments and kind of making everybody happy or. Yeah, I think, um, I mean, they've, they've all approached it in, in, in similar ways. I would say, you know, the NBA um, dominates in terms of, of social media engagement and spectators and fans who are not physical in arena spectators. Interesting. And so, you know, think about the, the, the millions and, and sometimes billions of people who support some of our major NBA franchises around the world. Um, they're tapping into segments that might hope to come to a game one day, but practically, realistically, never will. And in that sense, they're very similar to English Premiership soccer teams, where they've built a global business off the back of geographic, language, and cultural segments that are fan-based, not spectator-based. And that's different to, typically in the US, baseball and, and American football, which is much more connected to the spectatorship, right? Um, and although some of our major MLB and NFL franchises have got international fan bases, have got non-local fan bases, it's relatively small, right? Um, compared to what the NBA has been able to do. So, so I think that's the first point around segmentation is understanding who you're building your brand for, um, and, and who really is in your, on your radar as potential customers. And if you think beyond spectators, beyond people who are going to pay you for a seat, uh, might there be other segments where you can provide other benefits and monetize those as some of our major uh, NBA franchises have done? I think the other segmentation component um, is is really around motives, right? And the academic piece here is, is thinking about descriptive variables versus determining variables. Descriptive variables are typical demographics. And so we think about language, we think about income, we think about geography, we think about cultural background, perhaps we think about race and gender. And so we segment on that basis. But the reality is that most of the consumption behavior in the business of sports as in any industry is not driven by descriptive variables. It's not driven by demographics, right? Um, it's driven by what's called determining variables, which are often motives, right? So why do I support uh, the Clippers, the Lakers, or the Warriors, right? Um, and it may be a very different reason to the person sitting in the seat right next to me. Right. It might be around uh, family relationships. It might be other group belonging. It might be socialization. It could be prestige, could be badge value, uh, could be something about aesthetics. 
And so when we look into the different motives, right, the different reasons why people become fans, why they consume, we start to see some different segments emerging. Now, if we have a group of people who are all connecting to the Lakers, the Clippers, or whoever it is, because of group belonging, they want to feel part of a group. Well, then for that segment, I might create some loyalty clubs of some kind. I might create some kind of membership structure that allows them to connect with people who are like-minded, where there might be some overlaps in other recreational hobbies or interests. Because the itch that I'm allowing them to scratch, right? The, the, the real interest for them is not primarily what happens on the court, not primarily the aesthetics of it or the athleticism of it or, or the entertainment of it, but the opportunity to belong to a group that they identify with. And so if I tap into that, I could create a set of offerings, right? Products that I could sell to that group of people that will allow them to become customers that are different to what I might sell to other people, not just in terms of tickets, but in terms of membership and subscriptions and add-ons and those kinds of pieces. Merchandise, merchandise that specifically talks to different segments, right? So essentially what I'm doing as a business, as a sports business, is I'm thinking about these multiple segments wanting something from me that's different and therefore I provide value to them in a different way. So I have, as a sports business, I have multiple businesses because each of those businesses are catering to different segments. So whether it's demographic segments, most simply geographic, or whether it's determining variables like these motives, I can group customers in a smart way. And therefore, as a business, I can generate greater margins, higher returns from those segments because I meet their specific needs in a way that adds value to them, not just by giving them what I give everyone else. Yeah, that, that's fascinating. And are there ways that the like those those determining factors like show themselves? Are there ways that these these fans give that off that the hmm. brands can can use? Or how would how would you how would you know? Yeah. Unfortunately, it's typically not tattooed onto someone's <laughs> um, you know, demographic well, geography, the, those yeah. kinds of things you can see easy exactly. to kind of parse out, yeah. but not the Exactly. Uh, the demographics are easier to identify just by looking at a database, just by looking at the person. We can often tell some of those demographics. Uh, determining variables, more lifestyle, motive, psychographic kind of variables, we, we need to gather that information, typically qualitatively, by talking to the person and by analyzing their consumption behavior. So when are they coming to games? What games are they coming to? What are they doing when they're at games? Um, how are they interacting with our content between games? So that's all behavioral data, right? And our big data colleagues, our data analysis colleagues, like many of our students here at USF, uh, are really helping teams think about crunching the numbers, and looking at the behavioral data that we're gathering about our existing customers. So often determining variables come from an analysis of our data on existing fans. Whereas uh, demographic data, we can often gather that from non-fans, right? From prospective fans. Talking to them is helpful. Uh, and, and, and far too few of our sports businesses actually make the effort to communicate with their customers and find out what the itch they want to scratch. Um, so small surveys, especially qualitative surveys, asking their views on certain things, asking information about what they do outside of being a fan. What are their interests? What are the other parts of their lifestyle? Who are they connected to? Um, you know, some of my academic colleagues have done network analysis analyses, right? Where you look at the relationships between different fans and you start to see groups emerging in some way. So those are the quantitative, but mostly qualitative ways that you can gather this information a little bit harder uh, from existing uh, fans. Uh, and then once you identify that, you really lean into it. 
and you make sure that your value proposition to those fans is really appealing. So they buy into that. And then there's the secret. They will go and recruit others who are like them to come and be fans for that reason. Because human beings are connected outside of the sports teams, right? And so let's use our existing customers. Once we give them the value they really want, let's encourage and incentivize them to go and find others, right? I'm looking at the, the, the cycling picture behind you. You know, cyclists all know each other. They all ride with each other. And so if I can create a cycling interest group for my local baseball team, well, if I've got 20 or 25 of them, they're going to find another 20 to 25 just because of the worlds that they operate in outside of my, my fandom. Uh, and, and that's where you can then use that as a way to grow your fan base as well. Yeah, it's like a really basic perspective, you know, maybe a co college team that has people lined up outside versus, you know, the Los Angeles Lakers where everybody shows up at halftime or something like that. You know, you can kind of see absolutely. what their what their motives are in a sense. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. We're seeing some really good quantitative data analysis in arena, in stadium. Um, there's a company out of Cape Town, South Africa called FanCam. Um, and, and they've got a new business called Crowd IQ, which is doing some really great work with teams to use high definition cameras uh, in the facilities um, to watch what people are doing and analyze and therefore make some smart decisions in the game and especially after the game uh, based on what we're seeing. Right. Great operators. If you think about minor league baseball, you'd have the operator, the CEO, the president walking around and and they would have a nose for this kind of thing. They would be able to pick it up in today's sports business. We need to use data in a smarter way and algorithms uh, to generate some of those insights, because when you have 40 to 50,000 people in the arena, it's harder to just see the insights. Uh, and so using that data is very helpful. Yeah, you got to shake a lot of hands to get that that information um true which is what prison should be doing anyway <laughs> but yeah 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 um okay so kind of a broader question i know uh like about 10 years ago you talked about this decouching this idea that a lot of the tvs are getting better and the programming was getting great and there was more things that the stadiums would need to do to bring people out um mm -hmm. i guess kind of looking at it now when so much has changed. So much has changed. Like as an example, in college football, um, effectively reorganizing school conferences almost exclusively for TV uh, structure, and yeah. um, you know the sort of traditional cable providers being outbid by streaming and subscription and all of that kind of stuff. Um, where do you see? How, how have you seen that evolve? Is it what you thought would happen? And where does it? where does it kind of stand today for marketers and the advertising dollars as far as where they go on game day versus, uh, you know, TV, et cetera, et cetera. Absolutely. Decouching was this term that we came up with some time ago, pre pandemic, um, like world before pandemic. And, uh, it was a recognition that if you looked at the numbers, uh, even NFL games, we're starting to have declining spectatorship. Um, and around the world, we've seen media uh, push out, right? The, the, the quality of the media product uh, be a more effective competitor to actually going to the game. We've seen that in global soccer, for example. So there was a real issue some years ago about how do we get people off the couch away from their 4K big screen TV and the beer right there in the fridge. Uh, how do we get them to get off their butts, go to the game, spend money, you know, transport themselves there, deal with all the issues of the game and see that as value. Certainly what we saw in college sports and college football, for example, was it's not just about the Wi-Fi. Uh, we went through a phase pre-pandemic. We thought it was all about the Wi-Fi and just get faster Wi-Fi and the students will come out. And then what the data showed is it's not just about the Wi-Fi. It's a total experience we, we spoke about. Uh, and you want to make sure that the customer experience for those students or for those fans uh, makes coming out to the game 
uh, so much better than being on the couch. It's um, it's a little bit of an arms race when you think about the great advancements our media friends have made in the quality of the broadcast product. Augmented reality, uh, additional data layers, uh, very smart graphics. Um, the broadcast product continues to become better and better and better and better. Through the pandemic, obviously, that was everything, uh, as we were all on the couch and couldn't leave the couch. But now post-pandemic, we're seeing a balance between the broadcasters continuing to innovate, continuing to find ways to get people to tune in, because those numbers are strong in some respects, but also flagging in other respects because of the fragmentation of media, right? We're not all tuning in to ESPN on one cable box. There's now this massive fragmentation. So to get people to watch what you want to broadcast, when you want to broadcast it, that's becoming a little bit harder too. We got a bit of pent up demand coming out of the pandemic. People still want to, you know, reconnect face to face and go and have a beer together. Um, because those two or so years of, of COVID um, still has a little bit of a long shadow. Uh, and so there's some pent up demand, which we're still taking advantage of, but that will wane. And, you know, being face to face in a physical environment will become normal again. Right. Uh, and so we're going to have to, for physical events, continue to innovate around that experience. With all value propositions, there are the benefits that we need to strengthen and the negatives we need to mitigate. And we've got to do both of those, right? So just like the conversation we had about the triggers of disengagement, right? We've got to do both of those in order to get people to come in the first place, especially to a physical event. Um, you know, so I think what we're seeing around craft beers um, and quality of food uh, at physical sports events, I think is one response to that. What we're seeing in baseball, for example, around some smart pricing, um, access tickets as opposed to seat tickets, access to spaces as opposed to a specific seat where you have to sit for three hours. All of those innovations are a response to how do we get people to come out to our facility for a period of time? Thinking about strengthening the entertainment offerings, thinking about families. Um, the Padres uh, with their pet section um, and other facilities around the country and around the world with designated kid areas or designated areas for neurodivergent fans so that everyone in the family and everyone in the community feels inclusive and welcomed in that space. Those are some of the innovations that are going to have to continue to happen for sports facilities and teams who want to get people off the couch and get them to come to a game. Yeah. And do you see, um, how do you see like sports betting fitting into that? Is that, is that something that, you know, you notice now, even on TV, they, they have lines and over unders on, yeah. on that. Is that going to affect some of the going to the game or staying home or. And I think and so. That? I think, I mean, we, we, we've known for a while that, Fans or spectators, uh, when they're at a game, they may be interested in what other games are happening at the same time. The NFL is a great example, right? Um, daily and weekly fantasy football, and now putting the money popularity of red zone. And, Absolutely, yeah. Um, and so we've seen a few stadiums, right? I think about what the Jaguars have done and others who have created these red zone lounges or spaces where fans can go not just on their devices, but they can go and see what the spreads are and they can go and see what's happening in other games happening at exactly the same time around the country. Now, that, that, that's a tricky thing to do because for many facility owners and many teams, the assumption is people have come to this facility to watch me, to watch us play. Why would we want to distract them with stuff that's happening elsewhere? And part of the debate, I think, in executive teams is recognizing that for some of the people who are coming to our facility, um, they have an equal interest in what's happening in other spaces. 
So let's make it easier for them to come to our facility and then follow the others, right? Uh, and so these kinds of spaces, having sports books at the facilities, right? Uh, I think increasingly we're seeing some smart real estate plays or some smart rental plays with sports books, official sports books, having access to the space. There's a ballpark, there's an NBA arena, here's the sports book right next to it, right? Leveraging that physical environment. I mean, in retail, we know location, location, location. So it's the same kind of idea that we're seeing play out. So I do think it will, it will help bring people out to the physical facility if we get the combination right for some segment, not for everyone, but for some. And then equally on the broadcast side, uh, we want to reach those millions of people or billions of people around the world who are tuning in. We've got to make sure that the broadcast product has them participating in that betting behavior uh, on our platforms as opposed to someone else's platform. We're in a multi-screen environment where I may be watching you on a TV, but I've got two or three other screens open and I'm doing other things. So if I'm a broadcaster, I want you to be doing all of that on my platform. So for example, in South Africa, I've done some work with Supersport International, one of the, the major broadcasters in South Africa and across Africa. Um, and they've just made an investment into a sports betting platform. And so now you have the sports broadcaster and a sports betting platform owned by the same organization and the potential for kind of cross-pollination and for the viewer to have access to everything. And perhaps while they're watching, click here, make a bet there, all on one platform. And so I think that's where, whether it's in the physical or in the digital, I think we'll see greater connection in that way. And there are obviously some risks and some social issues that have to be mitigated. Uh, in global cricket, we've known for decades the downsides and risks of sports betting that influences what happens on the field, right? And where players have been um, persuaded unethically to change what they do on the field based on bets that are happening and the potential financial benefits they'd get if something interesting happens on the field. We're starting to see that play out in the US in a different regulatory environment. And so I think every market around the world has to think about what are the upsides and benefits from a tax point of view and from a consumer point of view, engagement point of view, with the ethical downsides that come with throwing that much money around um, for fans, for athletes in that space. And so that's a key question that I think the US will continue to, to think through and I know the leagues are thinking very hard about how to balance that as they move forward in the space. That's fascinating. Well, Michael, this has been awesome. Uh, is there anything you want to end on or anything that you're working on now or anything you want to touch on? Sure. I, I think the one question we haven't really spoken about is the more geopolitical context. Um, so I've, I've just helped publish a book in the last few weeks on the geopo geopolitical economy of sport looking um, really at, uh, at Eastern Europe and, and, and the issues around Ukraine and Russia and the implications for the IOC and FIFA, as well as other geopolitical questions around the world as sports teams and leagues, especially US-based sports teams and leagues, do business in parts of the world where the rules are different. The NBA is obviously very instructive. Um, a US-based original league that sees its DNA as American, um, but where it operates extensively in China and has had some issues related to its American identity or its Chinese identity. Um, in Africa, the Basketball Africa League, for example, one of the leagues of the NBA, um, you know, hosting games in Kigali in Rwanda, which is a really interesting facility, an excellent facility, but a political context and a human rights context that many in the NBA in the US would find very distasteful. And so balancing those geopolitical questions, thinking about what's happening in Qatar and Saudi Arabia, live golf. And I was going to say that the, the, the right? sovereign wealth funds. Exactly. Ownership of it. Yeah, exactly. US Silicon Valley money taking over European soccer, uh, Chinese wealth, um, you know, 
moving into Italian and Spanish and other teams. Um, so these are really interesting geopolitical questions. Now, for the average sports marketer, I'm thinking about the fan that's coming out on a Saturday night. But at a higher strategic level, the geopolitical questions are certainly ones that are increasingly influencing the choices that teams are making. I know, for example, our friends at the Golden State Warriors here down the road in San Francisco, as they think about doing business in Japan or in China, um, the, their Weibo account, for example, in China, and how they operate that differently to their Twitter account in Japan, differently to what they're doing here, for example, on TikTok, the Chinese-owned uh, app, but here in the U.S., and so for our students and alumni working at the Warriors, the day-to-day -day is about content and posting and platforms and sponsorship. But the broader question is, from a geopolitical context, how do we navigate some of these uncertainties? How do we navigate the power and influence and politics that often is at play in some of these bigger business decisions? So I think that's certainly something for leaders in sport for students and graduates and alumni of programs around the US and around the world to pause and consider how they would navigate that. What's their ethical core? What do they believe is okay or not okay? And how is their organization going about strategically building relationships with key power and influential groups so they can navigate this, right? We've known for centuries business will always navigate politics, right? And so the business of sport needs to continue to thinking about how it navigates this geopolitical context. Um, because I think increasingly that may determine some of the big profitability questions for our industry. Awesome. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. Um, is there, how can people find you or do you is it sure yeah yeah i'm on linkedin linkedin's uh i guess the easiest uh so dr michael m goldman um here at the university of san francisco uh and so linkedin would be an easy way uh, people can reach out uh and i'd love to pick it up the conversation and uh see what uh, students are interested in perfect well thank you so much